If you're joining on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. This video will be posted on YouTube after. And if you are watching this on Twitch, it's twitch.tv slash Marley Ficalora every single day. We talk about how to eat healthy, how to get healthy, and we watch videos about healthy food. And this one is called The Food We Are Born to Eat by John McDougall, TEDx Fremont. John McDougall, if you guys don't know who he is, he's the founder of The Starch Solution, advocating to eat potatoes and sweet potatoes, also known as tubers. He's saying that is the key food to live on, that is the key food to lose weight, to beat food uh, addiction and food habits. And so we're gonna watch this video. John McDougall, the founder of The Starch Solution at TED Talks. It's gonna be fun to watch. Starch. Yeah, it's uh, starch, you know, rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes. It's starch that has healed thousands of my patients. Like, for example, a young lady from the Bay Area had deforming rheumatoid arthritis to the point where she couldn't catch her mom. And Julia Baker decided at 17 years old she was going to change her diet. She was going to give up the cheese and the meat and the oil and switch to a diet based upon rice, corn, and potatoes. And it took about seven days before she started getting better. Or from Sacramento, Robert Cross used to work in the Attorney General's office. He got terrible chest pains, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, overweight. Went to his doctor for a solution. Quickly ended up in front of the cardiologist who recommended what? The heart surgery. He said, no, I've got a better idea. And he switched to a starch-based diet. Lost 60 pounds, dropped his cholesterol from 300 to 150, cleaned out his arteries. Or Deb Tissack from Chicago, had terrible multiple sclerosis. In fact, she fell down, stayed down for a month, couldn't get up. Her doctor told her she'd be in a wheelchair in five years and likely bedridden or dead in 10. She said, I'm not going to do that. So what she did is she switched to and that one obviously means a lot to me because my father does suffer from multiple sclerosis and he has been on this diet. Not the starch solution, but eating only fruits and vegetables, the, the pro-section challenge diet. Um, and he has seen massive, massive changes in his health. I mean, it's still a progressive disease. It's not a perfect one-shot wonder, but it does slow the progression and definitely helps, or at least it has in my father's case. So. Starch, yeah, starch. I'm Dr. John McDougall. I've been in this business for 44 years. And I'm the luckiest doctor in the world because my patients get well. It started out, I have to tell you, it started out by a bit of an accident. I was in Michigan, to Hawaii, my internship back in 1972. I stayed on Oahu for a year, practiced uh, just general internalship, internal medicine or internship type of uh, program. And then after a year, you know, I fell in love with Hawaii and I didn't want to leave. So I took a job on the Big Island as a plantation doctor. And there I worked as a general doctor for three years. I caught babies, I pronounced people dead. I did brain surgery in the middle of the night. But I learned everything that I know today during those three years from my patients. First thing I learned is that I wasn't a very good doctor. You know, I thought I was gonna make all these miraculous cures. I mean, I watched Ben Casey, Dr. Kildare, Marcus Welby, I knew what a real doctor did. And I went into this general practice on the Big Island of Hawaii, and I started taking care of these 5,000 sugar plantation patients. And I gave them the best pills I could find, sent them off to the best surgeons in Honolulu. And they wouldn't get well. They just stayed fat and sick. I thought it was because I was a bad doctor. I real, realized my limitations as a physician during those three years. I was humbled. The second thing that I learned from my patients, and it was a unique setting on the Big Island of Hawaii and the sugar plantation, is I learned how to eat because I was taking care of 5,000 people who ate differently. I was taking care of first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. Now, my first generation, they learned about how to eat when they were little kids in their native land of the Philippines, Japan, China, Korea. They learned a diet of rice and vegetables. And then they had the fortune of moving to the Big Island to start new families, a new life, 
But with them, they took their original diet, and they continued to eat rice and vegetables. The kids, who were influenced a little bit by the Western diet, they started to change. And by the time you got to the grandkids, you were looking at people who ate the traditional Western diet. Now, realize... And I'll say this, as I talked about this yesterday as well. When you go to a grocery store and you see someone over the age of 80 years old, oftentimes you will see fruits and vegetables in their carts. It's just a fact. When you go and you see someone under 30, under 20, in their teenage years, and you see a lot of junk food. And that's what he's trying to say as well about even other cultures, Japan, which has notoriously had amazing health, low heart disease. They, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, they lived on fruits, vegetables, starches, because that's what they had available. That's what they could grow. That was like rice, beans, corn, um, potatoes. So this is like, especially in like Latin American countries, um, South American countries, there's this abundance of rice and beans and it's, it's more affordable. You can grow it on your land, you can eat it. Um, and, and that was what our grandparents, our great grandparents and our great, great grandparents ate. And that's why heart disease was so much lower. Diabetes was so much lower and such. So these are people of the same genetics, same kind of work for over a hundred years on the sugar plantation. Yet before my eyes as a doctor, what I saw is I saw people living on rice and vegetables, no dairy, just a little bit of meat at most, trim, healthy, hearty people, no MS, no arthritis, no diabetes, no heart disease in that first generation living on those traditional diets. And then I watched the second generation get a little fatter and sicker as they abandoned starch. And then third generation, which feared starch, rice, corn, potatoes, and took on meat and dairy in their diet and oils. They got fat and sick just like every other American. Well, after three years, I, I had to leave as a general practitioner. I went back to Oahu to become a board certified internist. And I spent the next two years studying in the scientific library, in the medical library, next to Queens Medical Center, to see whether anybody else had made this observation that people who live on starch, rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, are thin, healthy, hearty, young looking, not just in the world today, but throughout history, and that will switch to a well-balanced diet, the rich American diet, with lots of protein and calcium and other of these wonderful nutrients that they got fat and sick. And what I found out was that scientists over the previous 100 years had made this observation. In fact, it goes further back than that. That was important because that told me right there and then that getting older didn't mean getting fat and sick. It didn't have to be that way. But as I read in the science, I discovered something else that it was really profound, and I'm sure it's going to be easy for you to understand. When you stop doing things that make people sick, they get well. And so it, if, if I had figured out that eating a well-balanced diet with lots of meat and dairy made people sick, then the only next clue I needed was the idea that I could be a a miracle doctor. I could fulfill what I wanted to do as a physician, which is to help other people by applying this very simple principle. And that is to feed people a diet for human beings. You, have, you know there is a diet for people. I know you might be surprised considering the variety that everybody... I will say it's not just a diet for humans either. You think about all the animals. What do they eat? The vast majority of animals only eat fruits and vegetables. And that has gives them these long, you know, amazing lives in the wild. So that's one thing I'll say is people always say, oh, that's human food when you're eating like an orange or an apple or a banana. It's not. It's food from the world for all animals to eat. And uh, we're all supposed to eat it. Everybody eats. But there is a diet for human beings. And each and every one of you ought to be able to answer that question for yourself, for your spouses, for your children, for your friends. You should be able to have that answer. When somebody says, well, what do human beings eat? I mean, after all, you know what a cat eats, right? Yeah, you know, cats are carnivores. And uh, horses, they have a diet. And parrots have a diet. You've never taken feed your parrot meat or your cat nuts and seeds. So every animal must have a diet. What is the diet for human beings? Well, history would tell us what that is. When you look back through history, and you can go back two and a half million years, 
and you see that the bulk of human beings have lived on starch-based diets. We have evidence from 44,000 years ago that said that the Neanderthals lived on starches. And from 30,000 years ago, we have population studies in Europe that talk about people living on starch-based diets. I mean, that's pre-agriculture, so they say. That's pre-civilization, so they say. But how about over the last 10, 12, 14,000 years? We have really evidence. We have written evidence about what people ate. And if you're a person of history, you know what people ate. Throughout human history, all large successful populations of people have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. I'm sure lots of examples are popping in your mind. If you're thinking about the Aztecs and Mayans, the people of the corn. And if you go a little bit further south, and you look at the Incas, they lived on potatoes, except when they went to battle, and then they switched to quinoa. And if you go to the Middle East, this, these people are from the bread baskets of the world. In Asia, I think most people can relate to the rice-based diets. And think about these people. Trim, hardy, healthy, strong warriors. The diet of human beings has been traditionally and always will be a diet based on starch with the addition of fruits and vegetables. What happened is people became more effective at gathering calories. And the richer people in every society, what happened to them is uh, they no longer had to eat the starches. They could instead eat the animals that were eating the starches. And as a result, there was a certain segment of the population throughout all of human history that became wealthier than the rest of the people. And these people could eat meat, peasant, or pigs, or other kinds of animal, and put the starches as side dishes. You had the pharaohs, and the kings, and the priests, and the priestess of 3,500 years ago who were described as fat. The examination of their bodies 3,500 years later shows terrible atherosclerosis, gallbladder disease, and all kinds of other problems of Western civilization. Well, we had a few kings and queens back then. And then as time went on, more and more people were able to eat like kings and queens. You recall King Henry VIII and his court. You know that they say gluttony, right? Gluttony is obviously, obviously deemed usually a not positive word, not a good word. And that's also coming from you know, kings eating all of the meat and dairy and gout and all those things. A lot of the wealthy class or the rich and and powerful people in the course of our history often died young from diseases, from food. What they look like? Americans. That's what they look like. And then as time went on, we became more efficient at gathering food. People became wealthier. We had the Industrial Revolution in its midst 150 years ago. And we had the discovery of fossil fuel. And as a consequence, almost everybody in Western society could eat like kings and queens. And what's the result? Can't you see it? Can't you see it? When people abandon their starch-based diets of rice and corn and potatoes with the addition of fruits and vegetables, instead they eat the food of royalty as people do in Western society, what would you expect? That you'd have people that look like kings and queens and are sick with diabetes and heart disease and cancer and multiple sclerosis. Anyway. And you can see it. And we were in Indonesia, Carolina and I, in Bali, and we were going for this waterfall. We were somewhere out in the middle of nowhere in Bali. And you could see these people that were walking carrying these massive bags of rice on their head. And they looked like they must have been in their late 80s, early 90s. And they were strong and they were trim and they were fit. And they were carrying these massive bags of rice. And they probably didn't have much more money than even the person who's the poorest person in the United States. But they were happy, they were smiling, they had all their teeth, they were still working, they were able to carry these massive loads of weight, and they were in their 80s and 90s, and you just don't see that in the United States of America. We retire at our 60s, we go to a retirement home, we start using walkers. If we're even lucky enough to even get to our retirement age these days and age, in this day and age, 
So it is something really remarkable when you see it in other cultures, the people that are still living on the farms, the people that are still living outside of society, the people living in the rural areas, not in the towns. And you contrast them based on these Western travelers, these Western tourists. Or you even go to that monkey village. We had this went to this monkey temple, the monkey temple in Bali. Do not feed monkeys human snacks as it is extremely bad for their health. You get in trouble if you feed them a potato chip or a Snickers bar. Of course, the monkey will eat it and like it, but it makes the monkey sick. But that's the setting of the country today. The statistics are very familiar to you, I'm sure. We live in a society where people are fat and sick, and not just the adults, but the children too. 30% of the kids are overweight. Not only are they overweight, but deep under their skin is a lot of sickness. These kids have atherosclerosis. They have arthritis. They suffer precocious puberty. Little boys are going through puberty at age nine. Little girls around age eight. That's five, six years before intended. We have a society of sick children. Now, come on. Civilized people don't let children be hurt. But somehow we do in our society. Somehow it's okay for the kids to be sick. Well, it's not okay. People should rise up to the occasion and protect our children. How about our soldiers? Yes, our soldiers are sick. We send our men and women across the world to represent us and to keep us safe, and yet half the soldiers are overweight. And underneath that, Obesity is a lot of sickness. What kind of society tolerates men and women who fight in our defense, tolerates them being ill because of the rich Western diet, feeds them a diet of kings and queens? Makes no sense at all. How about our businesses? Uh, we're competing in a world market and our, our fat and sick. How do we compete with people in Japan who live on starch-based diets or China or India? Oh, I know how we compete. We just wait till switch to the American diet and get fat and sick, right? No, I think there's a better way. We can work hard to get our employees healthy. How about the healthcare system where 20% of our gross national product is expected to be spent on illness? How can we ever get ahead? How can we solve the deficit? How can we fix this world? When we have a world where people look and feel and function like kings and queens. The solution is simple, but it doesn't favor business. That's the problem. We have a celebration here. George McGovern, Senator George McGovern, died last month, October 21st, 2012. George McGovern was essentially the author of the Dietary Goals of the United States, which were published in January of 1977. These goals were to be similar to the Surgeon General's report of 1964. The Surgeon General's report of 1964 changed America, changed the Western world. Back then in the 70s, half, today fewer than 20% of people smoke. Back in the 70s, obesity was half of what it is today. Diabetes was half of what it is today. Industry has won. Americans have lost. But we have an option to change that. It shows you, like I was saying, the deck is stacked against us. As you can see, the Surgeon General warning for cigarettes, awareness, funding to prevent cigarettes, reduce the amount of people using cigarettes, regulation restricting ages of people who can obtain cigarettes and where you can buy cigarettes, slowly but surely reduce the amount of people that smoke cigarettes from 50% to 20% over the course of only a few years. We could do that same thing. With food, we haven't. We have yet to realize, or we know the scientific data is probably even stronger for bad food and junk food and its impact on health than even we had during the time of cigarettes. But we have not made the change, the regulatory changes, the just the overall awareness, the truth campaigns about food and its impact. And so that's what he's talking about right here. He's saying the 50% thing, but for cigarettes, it went 
less people using it. Junk food, diabetes, heart disease, 50% doubled more people getting sick, more people getting hurt. So it went the opposite direction. By becoming informed about what the human being eats. The human being is a starch eater. All of you out there that are suffering, your families are suffering, and you're looking to modern medicine for a solution, stop looking. They're not going to cure dietary diseases with a pill or a surgery. You are going to fix dietary diseases by fixing the problem, which is the food. And when you fix the food, what happens is people get healthy. You as individuals, sick with various diseases, communities, countries, and the world can get healthy by making a simple change back to a starch-based diet. And I believe it will make economic sense to help a healthy country. I believe it's worth doing. Now, I know a lot of you who are new to this, you think about changing your diet. And somebody says to you, well, you have to give up meat. You have to give up dairy, your ice cream, your cheese, your chicken, your steak. You say, I'm going to starve to death. It's like last, asking me to give up breathing or asking me to drink up, give up drinking water. You think it's an impossible task. That's because you've been faced with a serious untruth about starches. You love starch. I know you do. When I mention rice and beans, you have a very positive reaction. If I mention pasta, you say, well, that's comfort food. Potatoes, I was raised in the Midwest. If it wasn't for mashed potatoes, I wouldn't be here today. So when somebody says you must give up meat and dairy, and they fail to finish the sentence, what you need to do instead is you need to live on starch, on oatmeal for breakfast, hash brown potatoes. For lunch, you need to have bean soup, pea soup, lentil soup. For dinner, you have bean burritos, pasta, marinara sauce, mushu, vegetables, and rice. You say, I can do that. Well, of course, you love those foods. This is the kind of education that we need. We need a new dietary goals for the United States. We need a government that will stand up and tell the truth to the people. We need a society that will not tolerate uncivilized behavior like letting our children be sick and our military be sick and our poor people be sick and our workers be sick because of the diet of kings and queens. And once we know that, we can change it, can't we? We can make a difference. Thank you very much. So that's Dr. John McDougall. I love him. I love his passion. I love how he's dedicated his whole entire life to trying to help people and to helping people. He's helped a lot of people. Let's um, switch over here. What did you guys think? Woohoo! Hey, Vankert. I, I like I said, it's so powerful what he said, and he's so passionate because he's a doctor that's seen what happens when people eat real food. When you change someone's life, when you make someone not sick that was sick, when you make someone happy that was not happy, when you make someone healthy that wasn't healthy, it's the most powerful thing you can do in the world. The hard part is that not as many people. Listen, when you make fruits and vegetables, that do when you make cake and ice cream. We have the deck stacked against us mentally, and that's because Girl Scouts sell Girl Scout cookies, not apples and oranges. That's because birthdays are not celebrated with a vegetable cake. They are celebrated with a sugar cake. That's because when you win the Little League World Series, you get an ice cream sundae, not hummus and pita chips. The deck is stacked against us. Our best memories are supplemented with junk food. Our worst memories are happier with junk food. Junk food is a huge part of our lives, and it is crushing us, and it is killing us, and that's the truth.